The Harvest Moon by Ted Hughes appeared in his 1975 collection Season Songs. This sequence of 28 poems is grouped into four sections, each of which represents one season. The Harvest Moon is the penultimate poem in the collection's summer sequence, its position indicating that Hughes will be concerned with the transition between summer and autumn. Hughes himself said that the collection was written within hearing of children, and Paul Keegan, the editor of his 2003 volume Collected Poems, describes it as an anthology for adults of poems written for children. This blurred identity is in evidence in this poem, where some of the almost nursery rhyme-esque language, imagery and rhyme, especially in the earlier part of the poem, such as the harvest moon rolls along the hills gently bouncing a vast balloon, is juxtaposed against more threatening imagery that evokes the apocalypse, such as while she swells filling heaven as if red hot and sailing closer and closer like the end of the world. In the poem, Hughes describes the appearance of the harvest moon, which is the name given to the full moon appearing nearest to the autumn equinox on the 22nd of September. He employs often contradictory imagery to convey its magical, mesmerising and magnetic presence, which simultaneously enthralls and terrifies people, animals, trees and crops as it draws them towards it. The literal harvest, when the crops are gathered in and the dying back of the land throughout the autumn and winter that the appearance of this moon heralds, and which is the necessary precursor to new life in the following spring, is suggestive of the metaphorical harvest of all the souls at the Last Judgment, which is said to herald the second coming, or the rebirth of Christ, a concept in the Christian faith which is both feared and longed for. The poem is written in free verse. It comprises five stanzas of five, three, four, four and three lines respectively. There's no set metrical or rhythmic structure and line lengths vary between four and 14 syllables. Although some lines do feature regular iambic metre, i.e. didum, 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 etc., such as the flame-red moon, the harvest moon, and the harvest moon has come, while others contain a variety of metrical feet, such as trochees, dumdi, e.g. booming, and anapists, dididum, e.g. like the end of the world. Most lines, however, do end on a stressed syllable, which creates a rising hypnotic rhythm, and a sense of energy. There's no set rhyme scheme, although Hughes does employ masculine or single rhyme, e.g. moon, balloon, doubloon, bassoon, and come, drum, in places. Most lines are end-stopped, although Hughes does make use of enjambment and caesura in places to modulate the rhythm to amplify meaning and to draw attention to particular words and phrases. Hughes's diction is fairly plain and simple, although he does make extensive use of figurative language in the form of simile, e.g. like a gold doubloon, metaphor, e.g. a vast balloon, and personification, e.g. where elms and oak trees keep a kneeling vigil. Oxymorons such as sinks upward and booming softly communicate the moon's mystical properties that appear to defy the laws of physics. There are a number of words and phrases which are reminiscent of the imagery in the book of Revelation in the Bible, which recounts the last judgment, such as the red moon, the bassoon, which brings to mind the seven trumpets sounded as a cue for apocalyptic events the end of the world, and we are ripe, reap us, 
which echoes Jesus's being urged by the angels to reap for the time has come. The title, The Harvest Moon, refers to the full moon that appears closest to the autumn equinox on the 22nd of September each year. As the poem progresses, the meaning of the adjectival noun harvest becomes metaphorical as well as literal. The poem begins, The flame red moon, the harvest moon. The diacopy in this first line, where the word moon is repeated with only two intervening words, and the caesura which separates the two noun phrases to create a pause, indicate that its presence will dominate the poem, and Hughes introduces its appearance with the compound adjective flame red, which suggests heat, energy and power. This is unexpected, as we usually associate the moon with various shades of white and gold, according to its position in the sky and other atmospheric features. And in fact, the moon only ever actually appears red during a lunar eclipse. This poetic license taken by Hughes suggests that he wishes us to see it as unique and symbolic, as later on this colour will evoke the appearance of the moon at the apocalypse as recounted in the Bible. The way it rolls along the hills gently bouncing gives it a sense of gracefulness and weightlessness, while the next four-syllable line gives prominence to the metaphor of vast balloon, as the image stands alone, filling the line as it fills the sky. Note how the moon, although flame red, is otherwise described at this point in the poem using language to make it appear non-threatening, such as rolls, gently bouncing, and balloon. It finally takes off and sinks upward to lie on the bottom of the sky, like a gold doubloon. Note the contradictory and oxymoronic language Hughes employs here, which is deliberately disorientating. The verb takes off evokes energy and upward acceleration, while the verb sinks suggests lethargy and downward deceleration, which is contradicted again by the oxymoronic upward, as it seems to smoothly come to rest on the bottom of the sky like a gold doubloon. Hughes draws attention to the moon's precious nature with this simile, as a doubloon was a Spanish gold coin associated in the popular imagination with pirates and ships filled with treasure. The image evokes how, after a shipwreck, gold coins would spill from the chest in which they were stored to sink through the water until they came to rest on the sea floor. Note the one instance of enjambment in this stanza between lines four and five, and sinks upward to lie on the bottom of the sky which evokes the moon's inexorable movement. Note also how Hughes uses the poem's form to reinforce its meaning. The first sentence is five lines long, with the full stop not occurring until after doubloon. Even though lines one, two and three are end-stopped with commas, the sentence doesn't actually come to an end until the moon appears to have come to a place of rest at the end of the first stanza. The final line here at 14 syllables, the longest in the poem, slowing the reader down. The first line of the second stanza, in contrast to the final one of the first stanza, is appropriately short at just six syllables, as it abruptly signals that the harvest moon has come. Note once more the oxymoron as it arrives booming softly through heaven like a bassoon. The verb booming suggesting high volume and the adverb softly indicating low volume. Hughes's use of the word heaven rather than sky would seem to indicate the moon's divine nature and power. A bassoon is a bass wind instrument that is able to be played two octaves lower than the oboe to which it is related, 
And so this simile suggests the depth of the sound which seems to emanate from this heavenly body as it calls to the earth. This image is also perhaps an allusion to the seven trumpets heard during the apocalypse. Hughes now presents the moon and the earth as having a close connection as the earth replies all night like a deep drum. The simile, like a deep drum, enhanced by the plosive alliteration of deep drum, which mimics its beat, suggests the solemnity of the occasion and the way in which the moon seems to have the power to tap into the earth's primitive heart or rhythm as they come together in musical harmony. This music of the spheres has an unsettling effect on the earth's inhabitants. So people can't sleep, so they go out where elms and oak trees keep a kneeling vigil in a religious hush. The anaphoric so, appearing at the beginning of the first two lines of the third stanza, underlines the compulsion felt by the people to leave their homes to commune with nature in the dead of night, as even the mighty elms and oak trees, symbolising strength and timelessness, are metaphorically brought to their knees in reverence. The use of the word vigil, which is a period of keeping awake during the time usually spent asleep, especially to keep watch or pray, evokes a sense that they are waiting for something momentous but as yet unspecified to happen. Note the predominance of long E sounds in these lines, with people, sleep, keep, kneeling, and the enjambment which propels the line forwards as man and nature feel compelled to come together. The stanza finishes on the short exclamation, the harvest moon has come. Note the repetition of this clause from the beginning of the second stanza, although this time it is punctuated with an exclamation mark, communicating the importance of its arrival. The fourth stanza continues. And all the moonlit cows and all the sheep stare up at her petrified. Even the livestock are captivated by the moon's energy and power. The diacopy and polysyndeton in this first line emphasising its omnipotence. As the animals bathed in the moon's light are compelled to stare up at her, almost like rabbits in headlights. The adjective petrified means to be so frightened that you are unable to move as though turned to stone. Note how the moon is no longer an it, but is now a personified she, suggesting that its power is becoming stronger. Note also how, in contrast to the stillness of those on earth, the moon is bursting with energy and movement, a contrast which is heightened by the caesura which separates them. While she swells, filling heaven as if red hot, and sailing closer and closer like the end of the world. The verb swells communicates a surge in growth as she seems to expand to occupy the whole of the sky. Her red-hot colour, suggestive of the moon-like blood at the apocalypse, described in chapter 6, verse 12 of the book of Revelation, which Hughes then makes explicit in the simile, like the end of the world. The diacopy in closer and closer suggests the moon's inexorable arrival. The poem reaches its climax in the final stanza, when the moon's power becomes sufficient for the gold fields of stiff wheat to respond to her with the cry, We are ripe, reap us, in language which is also reminiscent of chapter 14, verse 14 of the book of Revelation when at the last judgment Jesus is urged by the angels to thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come. The poem finishes on the apocalyptic vision of the heat from the moon being powerful enough to force the rivers to sweat from the melting hills, which is suggestive of the flood recounted in chapter 12 of the book of Revelation. Hughes leaves us with the feeling that this uncomfortable purging of the land is a necessary part of the cycle of life, 
without which rebirth is impossible. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions, please let me know in the comments section below and I'll do my best to answer them. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more videos on English language topics and exam techniques and English literature texts.